Tonight, uh, our speaker is Mr. Fred Williams. Um, Fred is a board member of the Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship, and he's also the co-host of Real Science Radio with Bob Inner. Um, he has a BS in electrical engineering, and he's a software architect of the, he was a software architect of the SCON repeater and IBM Sysplex timer, and was the lead engineer for Caterpillar's heavy equipment. I work for John Deere. <laughs> <laughs> so we're competitors too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, heavy highway GPS tracking devices. He's currently a software engineer in the end development at Micron Technology. And he spent much of his 37 year career knee deep in design and development of technology that often relies on principles from information theory. And I have to tell you another little story about Fred also. Uh, on the very first night that we started this group, uh, that was about three years ago. Fred was here with us and gave us a talk on the age of the earth. And we were so pleased to have him, and we were so pleased to have him back. And, um, I have to tell you a little story on him after the meeting. Uh, we, had a, we had a few questions come up during that meeting. And uh, after the meeting, Fred turned to me and said, welcome to the battle. And uh, I've never forgotten that, so thank you, Fred, <laughs> and welcome. So, Mr. Fred Williams. Hey, want to hear me good? Yes. There it is. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, let me switch over to my slide. Okay, information theory and the demise of Darwinism. I've been wanting to give this talk for uh, quite a few years, actually. It's a uh, very uh, Interest, I'm very interested in this topic. I have been for a long time. I've debated a lot of evolutionists on this and even some creationists. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit more later. So I'm a co-host with Bob and Yard on uh, Real Science Radio. We're, we uh, air every Friday at 3 o'clock. You can listen to us on AM 670. Or you can listen to the podcast, which is now second behind uh, Science Friday at PBS. We used to be called Real Science Friday and they didn't like that. So. They sued us, and uh, it was great for us, actually, because we got a lot of publicity. <laughs> we were in the LA Times, the uh, front page of the Denver Post business section, um, the New York Post. Anyways, so when you do a Google search on uh, what the universe uh, it is consisted of, you always get matter and energy. That's what you always get. You Google it, and this is what you're going to get. Dark matter and less dark energy. It's a normal matter and neutrinos. And so I could give an entire talk on this. In fact, we did for Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship on the Big Bang. And Bob Ingram put together what I think is one of his best videos if you're interested in this particular video. Um, I actually do have some copies if you want. Uh, you can talk me after uh, this presentation. It's, I think he did an excellent job with it. Okay, so John Wheeler, who is a famous physicist, he rubbed arms with uh, some of the biggest names. He coined the term black hole. He wrote that the universe has three parts. He actually built his career into these three parts. First, everything is particles. Second, everything is fields. And third, everything is information. So Norbert Weiner, professor at uh, MIT, he was uh, the founder of control systems, cybernetics. He said that information is information, not matter or energy. So imagine a robot that's been designed to play a piano, so you can make out from here the, the, the materials, the matter, and then obviously this thing's going to be powered by some, you know, a battery of some sort. But is, is that alone going to allow this thing to play the piano? You're going to need information, a computer program. So matter, energy, and information. How much does information weigh? If I had a piece of paper that had a note on one side and another note on another, I'm giving you two pieces of information, but that piece of paper weighs the same amount. You'd be amazed how many evolutionists will try to say that it weighs something because they're so committed to matter and energy is all there is. Mm -hmm. So I like what Bob says, you know, well, how about, what does the letter three weigh? Mm -hmm. You know, information has no mass. So uh, who's here? I think most of you are probably familiar with Carl Sagan. He, uh, uh, he had a, a show on PBS, and he also wrote a novel, a novel called Contact, and he was a, a devout atheist. He said, we humans are products of a long series of biological accidents. 
So here's an atheist, and he writes this book, and then they make it into a movie. And I'm going to show you a very brief clip of this movie. It's one of the uh, dramatic moments in the movie. And it's interesting if you listen to what they discovered. So search for extraterrestrial intelligence. That's, uh, you know, they're looking for signals from outer space of alien uh, intelligence. So let's watch this movie clip. So let's look at some examples. 
So imagine you saw laid out on your table these Scrabble tiles. Well, you can see from here, there's some words you can make out, but is this really information? Or is this just some random thing that happened? It's specified because you can make out some words and patterns, but it's not complex. I want to give you an example here of where we definitely have information. So look at all the tiles that are uh, laying on the table, but you see three that are vertical, four, excuse me, four that are vertical, and they spell out the word love. We can say with pretty much a lot of certainty that that is information. It's both specified and complex. Somebody did that on purpose. If you imagine another example, you shuffle cards. And uh, by the way, how many times do you have to shuffle cards to completely shuffle the cards? Anybody know? About six or seven. Right? It's seven. Okay. Yeah. So you, if you shuffle a deck of cards eight times, you're wasting your time. It's well proven by in the fact it was an MIT thing, if I recall. So anyways, if you uh, shuffle cards and you get what's on the left, that's what you'd expect, just random cards. If you get what's on the right, you know something's up. It's either a magic trick or there's something to it, because the, the probability of that, of that happening is astronomically low. In fact, it's 10 to the 67th power. And if you think of, you know, actually get the exact set of cards, um, perfect, say, the perfect uh, suits all the way through, um, there's 10 to 80 particles in the universe, just to show you how many possible permutations you can get with cards. So, okay, so back to Git. So his, he has five levels of information. I think this is all reasonable. I, I really, I did enjoy Warner Git's book, and I met him at Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship quite a few years ago when he came out and gave a talk. And I did talk to him briefly after the meeting. I disagree with him that uh, something uh, with Shannon, and I'll talk about that later. But he talks about statistics, and then the syntax, the semantics, the syntax would be like the letters and the words. Um, the semantics would be the meaning, and then pragmatics, which means action. And then you came up with, you know, alphabetics with this purpose. So that's get universal information. I really do like this one of the laws he came up with in his book, that universal information can only be produced by an intelligent center. That should be a law of science because it's true. You cannot find any counterexamples. So sharing information, I'm going to go back to this. Shannon information always was mostly Git information. Now, so Git said that Shannon information had no meaning and that um, uh, if, if, uh, more, the more information, the more random you got in your sequences and your symbols, the more information it had. That's a misunderstanding of information theory, uh, and I'll, I'll explain why. So now I'm going to talk about Shannon information. And, and I like to, me personally as an engineer, I prefer when I talk about information to refer to use Shannon information for a couple of reasons. I think it's suitable. Second, and maybe most important, it's what evolutionists use. That's how they understand information, and we can beat them on their own terms. So, Shannon information is basically sending something through a channel that gets encoded and then decoded and then received by a receiver, and it has an impact of noise. So now I'm going to spend about three minutes on a technical part of the presentation you have permission to go to sleep or ignore me or get on your cell phones. And then the alarm clock's going to go off when I'm done with this part. But I did want to quickly explain for those who might be interested how Shannon came up with this formula for information. And it's really not that complicated. First, let's look at this example. If you had a bucket of balls, and you had red balls and green balls, and you were asked, okay, uh, I'm going to, you know what, how many, what, we've got some number of red and green balls. And we're going to put them in a bucket. And what are your what what knowledge do you have? Say, if you see somebody put in four red balls into a bucket, and you know there's only going to be four to be put in there, you're going to know if you're going to have high knowledge that a red ball is going to come out. You're going to win if it's a game show. If you happen to get three red balls and a green one, and they go in the bucket, you're uh, you have medium knowledge and medium entropy. You have some amount of uncertainty, though. You could be unlucky and draw a green ball. Now, if you're unlucky, then you're going to get two of each, and now you only have a 50-50 chance. So it's high entropy, and basically randomness increases information entropy. And this is where we have disagreements with, like, we, uh, Warner Gibb thinks that this is high information, that Shannon taught that, and he did not teach that. And by the way, I, just to, to make a quick point, Academia, you know, uh, teaching calculus in the colleges, there's no agenda there, so you learn math. 
Thank goodness that in academia, by and large, they teach information theory as it is and without an agenda. They could have had an agenda with it, not the grand and misses information, because then that kind of fits with evolutionists wanting chaos and randomness to, you know, to, to create all life. But the academia doesn't teach that. I, 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 I've looked at reports, uh, you know, uh, uh, curriculum from MIT, Stanford, University of California, etc. So let me describe quickly the Shannon uncertainty. So let's say you have uh, four possible characters that you can receive. So it's low entropy if you get all A's, and if you have a pattern where you have some number, a more number of A's, you have medium entropy, and then if you have an equal number, of high entropy. It's similar to what I said before. So Shannon thought it was important to calculate the probabilities of each and to come up with a way to most efficiently send data through a channel. And I can tell you as an engineer, and especially this, the IBM Sysplex timer, these concepts are very important. And I'll try to explain that now. So let's say you're, you're, you get two signals are sent out. So an A and a B, you need one bit of information. So imagine my hand is one bit. It's either thumbs up, you know, gladiator, you're, you you survive, you live, thumbs down, you toast. Only two possibilities. So the reason why Shannon uses log base two because it works well for that. You can take the number of possibilities two, and take the log of two of base two of that. And you need one bit to be able to convey an A or a B. To do A, B, C, or, and, or D, log two of the four possibilities, you need two bits. So now, if I've got another hand of bits, then that that would be. One, one and zero, one and zero here, one and one here, and zero and zero. So, you know, it's the same thing with eight. But here's kind of a point to realize why probabilities are so important to Shannon. What if you only had a very simple example? You've got two characters, or excuse me, let's go with four. You've got four characters that you can send in a channel. You need two bits, right? You need your hand, you can do possibility of four combinations. What if you have a fifth a letter E that you need to transmit? The way to do that is you, you have to dedicate one bit to saying, I need to send a second message. Okay, so that's why probabilities are important. So the lower probability messages are the ones that are going to be the second message. That way most of the time you're efficiently using the channel with the up and down on the on the one that has a more probable messages. Okay. So if you use this equation, you can calculate the entropy and the amount of information that is sent to the receiver. And really, another way to look at this is the average number of questions you need to get to determine like what uh, symbol you're going to get. What's interesting about Shannon entropy is very similar, if not identical, to Gibbs entropy and you know, the whole second law of thermodynamics. Okay. The worst part's over. <laughs> Okay, so many creationists and evolutionists confuse uncertainty with information, and I wonder if it does without question, he still does. Shannon wrote an engineering paper on maximum throughput through a channel, so naturally such mathematics would be agnostic to the message content. So in his paper, he said, the engineering problem here doesn't care about what the meaning of the message is, but then people took that and misinterpreted it and said that Shannon information doesn't have meaning. That's not true. A year later, Shannon co-authored a book with Warner Weaver and wrote that meaning, action, and purpose were implied in their work. And this is what he wrote, and that they wrote in this book, Level A, how accurately can symbols of communication be transmitted? How precisely do the transmitted symbols convey the desired meaning? This is Shannon, a year later. How effectively does the received meaning affect conduct in a desired way, the effectiveness problem? Those are really three levels of Shannon information, if not all five, if you wanted to get down to the uh, you know, you could really fill up five in there. So, let me give you an example. Let's talk about it, Shannon information, and then I'll do a really fun quiz. It only gives a Wheel of Fortune example. So, information is not uncertainty, as I've been saying before. Information is the reduction of uncertainty. So, imagine you've got the sender through the receiver, and you ha always have to account for noise. In engineering, that's a huge thing. With everything, we have to account for noise, however you want to call it. And by the way, the channel could be anything. It could be an Ethernet connection. It could be a piece of paper that I hand you. It could be the Bible. That's, you know, anything that's the medium is a piece of the channel. 
So imagine that, uh, you know, Bob and I did this uh, promo thing up at Red Rocks. It was kind of silly, but you can watch it on YouTube. Now, if you, if you get noise, if you apply a bunch of noise and you get this as the signal afterwards, your information is zero, according to Shannon theory. I only show this because years ago, I don't know if any of you are boxing fans. I, I used to be, not so much anymore. Hearns Hagler was a really big fight a long time ago. And me and a friend tried to find that fight in Boulder. And, and the bar said they had it. We went in there, and all we could see was noise. But we could make out sh shapes and characters. But I was able to tell from the noise that my guy had lost because he was a guy with hair. So, you know, I had a some amount of information. The noise distorted the signal, but you still, I did still receive some information. So what happens if your source is noise? You're going to have no information because uh, your uncertainty before and after is the same, and so you're going to have zero information. You'd be surprised how many evolutionists and some creationists say, well, Shannon says that that's maximum information. That's not true. Because in his paper, there's a section dealing with noise, and you have to subtract out the, the, uh, the uh, noise. So let's look at an example of reduction of uncertainty. So I'm a season ticket holder of the Broncos, and I'm going to go through this. And what they'll do at those games and at Nuggets and Avalanche games, I don't know if they still do at Avalanche games, sometimes they'll show, they'll ask you to guess who the player is, and then they start removing tiles. So anybody want to take a guess who this is? Anybody know yet? So any idea? Riddell? <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like he's carrying the football. Any guesses? No, close. What about Rod Smith? Rod Smith? Rod Smith? Yeah, Rod Smith is number 80. Okay, you're right, it's Carl Davis. <laughs> but as you can see, as I remove tiles, it reduced uncertainty, and eventually you got full information. Information is the reduction of uncertainty. So here's a kind of an interesting uh, Wheel of Fortune example. So those are the characters that are available. And it's funny, the two guys totally blow it. And then the lady's the one who gets it right. Hey, there is a P. People, your time starts now. A group of pill pushers? <laughs> Super Bowl 50, and I only show this how glad I found it, because I remember, you know, a, a plane was doing this ad for Doritos, so obviously that's information, but I almost didn't get to see Super Bowl 50 because we were walking to the stadium, and I'm looking up at that thing, and I did one of those one-minute falls, you know, and when you're older, it hurts when you fall, and I'm doing this, and I was losing my balance, and it's like, I'm going to go down, and I did, thank goodness I didn't break anything. 
Um, so is this information? So information theory to sum up again, Claude Shannon said it's reduction of uncertainty between the singer and the receiver. We just <coughs> to it. It's the way I when I ever debate information with any anybody that's a you know on secular side, I use Claude Shannon information because that's what they use. The other ones are fine. You know, Werner Gitt's a great scientist. I really like him. I, we just have a disagreement on it. he's got a misunderstanding on Shannon, or El Truman has done. He's he came up with code and information systems, but I think it's too complex. So I don't think we'll ever take hold of the creation movement. Too much, too much there. So let's talk about information in nature. So this, I think, is a really cool example. Consider the golden clover. It migrates from Alaska to Hawaii, which is about 2,500 miles. The flight takes 80 hours, three days, four nights. Puts on an additional 50% of weight, about 70 grams, before embarking. And it converts 0.6% of body weight per flight hour into motion and heat. And if you think about that, helicopters consume about 4% of their weight per hour and a jet 12%. So this is incredibly efficient. So at this rate, all the fuel, body fat, would have been exhausted 500 miles short of Hawaii. They've done the math, they calculated, and this is true. This would happen. So the birds would run out of steam and they'd plunk into the, into the ocean. But they do make it to Hawaii. Anybody know how? I mean, <laughs> right in the air currents? Yeah. Did you hear that? They fly in V formation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and the weaker birds will take turns, um, you know, uh, they'll kind of stay in the back and stronger birds will go up front, which is in interesting in itself. Where do they get the information to do that? <laughs> you know, when the parents leave, they, they you know, they mate in, in Alaska. The young birds don't, aren't told by their parents, this is what you have to do to get to Hawaii. First of all, how do they find Hawaii? It is <laughs> remarkable in itself. They could go, and actually because of this flying the V formation, they could go 500 miles past Hawaii because of the savings that they're doing here. So, again, where's the information? How does evolutionists explain that? Do the little chicks say, hey, we, hey look, there's, they're flying in a V formation, you better do that too. No, the information was already programmed in their, in their brains. So Charles Darwin offered the following test for his theory. You think about symbiosis and its information content. If it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species, species had been formed for the exclusive view of another species, it would annihilate my theory for such could not have been produced through natural selection. And we found all kinds of examples of symbiosis in nature. But I really like this, this one here. I'll just show you real quick. It's a shark and a cleaner fish. And man, how does evolution explain that? It allows one type of fish into its mouth to clean its teeth, the, 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 the cleaner fish. So how did, how did this ever happen? There must have been a lot of cases where this has been fair well for this guy. But this is the one I like that's recent in the news, is uh, you know these trees that communicate with each other, and they call it the wood wide web. I mean, that's really what they call it. She discovered the trees send warning signals about environmental change, search for kin, and transfer their nutrients to neighboring plants before they die. And you've got a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with uh, the fungi beneath them. So, uh, we, uh, Bob recently interviewed Lee Spetner on the radio, and I heard it was really good. I haven't listened to it yet. And he, uh, you know, he's one of the guys that, uh, he wrote a book uh, after the discovery of DNA, and it's funny, I was asking Bob about this, and I said, well, what's, you know, when did he become a creationist? Well, when he wrote his book, he was an atheist, and he said that after he wrote his book, he went, he read his own book, and he became a creationist. <laughs> it's like, how can this happen by chance? So he wrote a book called Not By Chance, it's one of my favorite books. And uh, he said, in all the reading I've done in the life sciences literature, I've never found a mutation that added information. And he speaks in terms of Shannon information. 
The, the uh, neo-Darwinian theory says not only that such mutations must occur, they must also be probable enough for a long sequence of them to lead to macroevolution. So he's never found a single example, and there should be zillions yeah. if evolution is true. Uh, Jerry Bergman, uh, he's so prolific writer, uh, he, he did some research and he did a search for uh, mutate, beneficial <laughs> mutations. And he had, uh, you know, he's able to search these databases that have all this uh, information from the genome. And he found 453,732 mutation hits, only 186 were beneficial. And he, he looked at all 186, and trust me, if you know Jerry Bergman, he would have looked at all 186. And when he examined, examined them closely, they resulted in the loss of some function. It was actually a loss of information, and yet it was called beneficial. So has anyone seen this clip? This is a yeah, famous clip if you haven't seen it. This is a, he's going to ask Richard Dawkins to give an example of information at the genetic level. Go ahead and watch the reaction. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolution of process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? seen that before. And so that went on for a little bit longer. And he, he never really, he could not come up with an example. And there should be all kinds of examples. So, you know, in the years I've deba debated evolutionists, a lot of times they'll refer to the sickle cell trait. And this is from a, a, a popular humanist website. You go on there right now, and it's, it's called bigthink.com. And they're, you know, they're giving examples of uh, beneficial mutations. And this is how desperate they are to find them. They use a disease. Yeah. So here they say, people with just one copy of this gene are 29% less likely to get malaria. While people with two copies enjoy, and you've got two copies, you're in serious battle. Yeah. Enjoy a 93% reduction risk. And this gene variant causes at worst a mild anemia. So when they're saying the one copy version causes at worst a mild anemia, that's not even true. Yeah. Nowhere near is debilitating the sickle cell disease. So that is not true. Uh, they're using a disease as an example. And I don't know if you guys remember when uh, Tim Tebow had that great playoff game against Pittsburgh Steelers and how one of the Steelers had to stay home because of the sickle cell trait. He had lost, uh, he had lost his, uh, let's see here, uh, damage, he has damage so severe when he had this that he had his spleen and gallbladder removed from the sickle cell trait. So that's a serious disease, and that's not an ad, it's a loss of information. <coughs> so here's another one that got them all excited, it was nylon-eating bacteria. This one was, became a favorite of theirs. And so here's the evolutionary story. In 1975, Japanese researchers found some bacteria living in a pond next to a nylon-producing plant that could digest nylon. Nylon wasn't invented until 1935, so there'd be no reason whatsoever for a bacterium to be able to digest nylon before it was invented. Thus, in a mere 40 years, a new gene had evolved, allowing the bacteria to digest something they otherwise could not digest. Okay, that sounds like a, you know, maybe a reasonable, you know, um, story for them to try to promote. But here's the problem with it. So, the bacteria, it does not digest nylon. They digest broken down bits of nylon molecules. And the ability to digest nylon waste products is incredibly common in bacteria and other organisms from a diverse set of environments. So Dr. John Stanford, he was the, uh, he headed up the, um, the genomics department at Clemson University, and uh, he's now a creationist. He was an evolutionist for many years and became overwhelmed by the, uh, the information in the genome, and he became a creationist. They did an analysis and they found that, it, it, he said, our analyses indicate that nylonase genes are abundant, come in many diverse forms, are found in a great number of organisms, and these organisms are found within a great number of natural environments. This totally refutes the, the claim that they evolved in 35 years the trait to digest the nylon. Um, but again, they actually only digest the nylon byproducts, and that capability has always been there, and we find that in all kinds of other organisms, including mammals. Okay, another one that's a favorite of theirs is gene duplication. It's a mutation that does occur, 
And they speculated, this one guy, uh, this evolutionist, Susumu Ono, I think that's how you say it, Ono? Yeah. To speculate that the gene for one of the enzymes had come about from a combination of gene duplication with a frame shift mutation. So that's their dream. It's like you have this extra copy of a gene, and then it somehow takes a mutation, and now you have a mechanism for adding information. So that was disproven in 2007. He said that there was no frame shift mutation involved. And however, many genes have been discovered which did evolve by gene duplication followed by a frame shift mutation. They really want that. A gene duplication plus a, a mutation. Gene duplication mutation. And I'm not kidding. I had to highlight that. Citation needed. <laughs> if they had one, they would use it. Trust me. I did a search. As I, you know, for quite a while, I could not find any examples in the scientific literature of a gene duplication and, a, and followed by a frame uh, shift mutation. Now, maybe they exist, they exist somewhere, but they don't have any examples. Okay, and then when you actually do a search for gene duplication, you come, here's what I came up with. <coughs> Pancreatic cancer. Gene duplication explains tumor aggressiveness. And then here's another uh, uh, Wikipedia page on uh, gene duplication, and, and it's rolling all these different cancers. It's not a good mutation. Okay, so on gene duplication, another point to make as far as information goes, so this is a product we did in the data many years ago. We sold it through IBM, and this is called an SCON director. And I was responsible for those two CPs in the middle as far as the redundancy. So both of these CPs had the exact identical software on them. But if one of them failed, they were, they were switching logic to switch to the other CP. So that was not double the information. The only extra information was the switching logic that was needed to, to switch between the two CPUs. So, that's the added information is the switching logic. It's not double the information. And then RAID 5, I don't know if you guys are familiar with storage and RAID devices, but you don't get double the information by having an extra set of drives. I'm not going to go through that. Um, it's, it's maybe you get 20% more information um, because of the redundancy that you have through all these stripes along this RAID device. I'm not going to skip that. Um, so who here has heard of Dr. Francis Collins? He's pretty prestigious, he's NIH. And uh, so he did this thing with gene duplication and it says the new analysis shows how extra copies split the work. So that's, that's a fantasy. He even admits that in so many words at the end of that article. And just real quickly, if you think about how if you have something split the work, we did a product that, uh, for uh, IBM called Sysplex Timer. And you had two identical units, exactly identical, running the same exact software that would be connected to each other, both for redundancy and then also include the, improve the clock act accuracy by using this phase lock loop between four oscillators. That's some guy at MIT actually designed that oscillator system and I wrote software for it. Um, that's not double the information. Um, and if you remove one of these guys, the system was degraded, and you were in the in the in the place that uses these, and it's very critical for them to have accurate at the time, and especially the same time to go to a different IBM mainframe. So it was more important to have the same time as it, than it was to say, okay, I'm off by five minutes. They don't they don't like that, but they definitely <coughs> don't like this IBM mainframe being five seconds different than this one. That's too much. So this is super cool. The DNA, they recently discovered, I'd say in the last 10, 15 years, that the DNA encrypts multiple codes. Bill Gates said the DNA is like a computer program information, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. So what does this mean, that you can have, that DNA can encrypt multiple codes? Imagine reading a book, and, you read, and it tells a great story, and then you can read the book backwards. By the, read the letters backwards in the book and it tells an entire, entirely different story. They found that the DNA can be read in one direction to, to uh, perhaps uh, dis, uh, describe a protein that's going to be built, and then the reverse direction to add like qualifiers to it, how much of the protein should be built. They've actually found multiple ways that the DNA can be read, multiple dimensional ways. That's, that's unbelievable. How could, that, how could an engineer ever not believe that there's intelligence out there, that there's an information dealer. You, you, you are without excuse. 
So here, scientists discovered double meaning in the genetic code, second code hiding within the DNA. So imagine you've got this DNA that says build an antibody to fight infection, and then you read it backwards and it says add more when it's cold outside. So here's the problem. So now you've got this DNA chain that does these two different functions. If you take a if you suffer a mutation, you're going to plot with both messages. So now you're going to build art of body, you know, and, there, and so it's, it totally becomes a, um, a, gene, a gene that uh, will get recycled. And the uh, quality control system in the genes is amazing, too. Here's what this scientist said. The fact that the genetic code can simultaneously write two kinds of information means that many DNA changes that appear to, appear to alter protein sequences may actually cause disease by disrupting gene control programs or even both mechanisms simultaneously. Could you pronounce his name? <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe later. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> so, when DNA encrypts 12 codes, a rare beneficiary, so they found actually 12 different ways that DNA can be read, not just the two I mentioned. That's amazing. So a rare beneficial mutation, let's say it even happens, it has to not break functionality of the other 11 codes. So how could you ever get the beneficial mutation? You can't. So this is a guy, he's a, he's a founder of the a Thompson Mass Spectrometry Laboratory, member of the National Academy of Sciences in Brazil. He's become, he's quite a prestigious scientist. He said this, as a biochemist, I became skeptical about Darwinism when I was confronted with the extreme intricacy of the genetic code and its many, it, it, and it's many most intelligent strategies to code, decode, and protect its information. Okay, here's another one that they were celebrating, and they said, this is Mother Jones, one of the many, many, many liberal uh, media outlets on the internet. Uh, and it says, this is the most powerful evidence for evolution that you can imagine. And what is this? So let's talk about it. And by the way, that's a big science. <coughs> So here's the claim. All great apes have 24 pairs of chromosomes. Two fused together in the past to arrive at 23 pairs on humans, because they think we share a common ancestor with great apes. Yeah. So they looked at the genome before they could really get details of it. The correspondence of chromosome 2 to 2 ape chromosomes. So they see they said that there's near identical DNA sequences. I'll show you an example. So they found the presence of a vestigial centimeter and the presence of a vestigial telomere. So let me show you what I mean. So here's the ape, and then those two fuse together, and now that's what we have in humans, and they say that they can see like little pieces of uh, functionless vestigial centimeters. You know, the center of the chromosome has a certain pattern. Okay? So they claim they found that, so that would boost their theory that this fusion happened. Same thing here. They say, oh, look in the middle, there's these things that are like telomeres. We knew at the time when they did this that they were selectively picking pieces and we did not fully have the ape or the human fully sequenced. So they were using scant data and cherry picking. We knew that at the time, but now we've actually got the genome. Here's what we've discovered, and this is from Jeffrey Tompkins. Of course, the evolutionists aren't going to report on it. When we looked at it, there's a functional gene sitting right there. Totally refutes their argument. It's, made, it's a binding switch. <coughs> he concludes, functional genes do not arise by the mythical fusing of telomeres. The alleged, alleged fusion site is not a degenerate fusion sequence, but is, and since creation, has been a functional feature in an important gene. So I show this slide. This guy's Dr. Thomas Snyder. Uh, see, uh, he uh, got his PhD from the uh, University of Colorado. And he's become somewhat famous for uh, coming using information theory to identify those binding sites, the one we just talked about. I used to correspond with him quite a bit years ago, and I, I, I've been thinking about maybe trying to get a hold of him again and ask him about, hey, what do you think of this so alleged fusion of the, you know, um, ape chromosome? And because he's really big on identifying binding sites. And the work he did here was impressive. And he was a begrudging supporter of mine back when I was debating evolutionists because he's sharing information theory and he agrees 100% that H is not entropy that we talked about earlier. Randomness is not information, is what I'm to try to tell you. It's not true. 
And so he would defend my arguments that two dictionaries, identical dictionaries, is not double the information. Um, he's a committed Marxist, he's an evolutionist and atheist, but he understands information theory and he became a valuable, if not unwitting, ally back in the day when I was really debating the evolutionists on this. So what's interesting is, and we, we covered this on the radio, they, uh, the NIH reported that it would take 100 million years to change a binding site. <laughs> 100 million years. And yet we're supposed to be related to chimps, uh, you know, a chimp-like ancestor in the, within the last three to five billion years. Just thought that was kind of ironic. And then finally, if you think of uh, what they, they try to, here's another claim they make, that the mistakes that argue for evolution, here's what they're talking about. So Kenneth Miller, this evolutionist, here's his analogy. I ran your paper, and this is a valid analogy, it's true. I ran your papers through a program that looks for unusual matching strings. You guys list all the same six words in the same six ways, and when you have matching mistakes, there's no other explanation other than a common ancestor for the paper. So my sister, who was a college professor, she would use these programs to detect uh, plagiarism and you know things like this. Uh, and so I, they really, professors really do have programs to do this. So his claim is, oh, I found the same misspelled words in six different papers. And so the claim is this, that you've got this broken pseudogene, a functionless gene, and it happens to have the same mutation in both chimps and humans. But here's the problem with that argument. It always has been from the day one. And it, the, the argument totally evaporates if those pseudogenes are not useless genes. That was their number one premise. This is a useless gene. And hey, it has the same mistake in both humans and chimps. But that was always a flawed assumption. And now we know that pseudogenes, everyone they've looked at now, we know that they have function. They started to realizing they must have function because they find a mutation in one, and it was related to a disease. So obviously, it's functional if a mutation causes it to cause a disease. Pseudo genes that have been suitably investigated often exhibit functional roles. And this is from you know, this, pub, this secular publication. And just as, as here's another thing, the impact of a beneficial mutation on the genome is akin to taking a $10 bill from Nolan Arenado's $260 million contract. <laughs> Why do I bring that up? Um, Dr. John Sanford, who I mentioned earlier, I thought he came up with a good analogy, and that's the princess and the pea. I was actually, I was never familiar with that like, a fairy tale. Uh, are you guys yeah. know how yeah. it works? Yeah. Yeah. About how if you're a princess and you're in a bed, and if you detect the pea, that proves you're a princess, and it's like layers and layers and layers of mattresses. Right. So the point here is, even if a beneficial mutation occurred, let's just say that you give them one, okay? Let's say it occurred. Natural selection can only select people. It can only select individuals. Nat natural selection cannot see at the genetic level. It cannot see down into your genome to see that there is some advantageous change. It can only select an individual. So natural selection could never, ever, ever even see a beneficial, beneficial mutation, even if it occurred. Okay, so this is math plus evolution. It's, it never has worked out well for them. We knew that when they said that we were 97% similar to chimps, that that likely wasn't correct because they were using assumptions. They didn't have the genome. And yet, <coughs> the Smithsonian Institution and so many places still say, they even say like 98% similarity. And my wife was grabbing me as I was heading in that section because she knew I was going to cause trouble and she was correct. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when they were saying 97%, I actually sent uh, Dr. James Crow, who published regularly in, that, in Nature Magazine and Science, the Science Journal. Um, and if you do the math on it and use favorable assumptions for evolution, I showed him that between 40 and 60 offspring per breeding couple were, were requir required just to break even. So how are you going to evolve anything? And I was being super favorable to their assumptions. And he replied back. I was surprised that his, his response was, you raise a serious question to a serious problem. There was, those were his exact words. We ended up corresponding with each other. Here's a guy who writes for Nature Magazine and writes about biology and genetics. He's since passed away. And so I asked him, why do you believe in evolution? Because obviously, in your, even your own articles, you talk about how the human race is going extinct. And he said, because of astronomy and the fossil record and geology, he could not use his own expertise, his own study, to defend evolution. 
So when you actually look at the actual rate, if you calculate it based on the current numbers, the required offspring would be 16,000. And that still uses incredibly favorable assumptions for evolutionists. From each? Each couple, mm. each parent would have to have 16,000 offspring to keep the, the, the species from deteriorating or to be able to evolve from a chimp-like ancestor to humans <coughs> and chimps. So you have ancestor, human, chimps. You would need 16,000 offspring per breeding couple just to break even, just to not de-evolve. Dr. James Crow was aware of this problem, and other evolutionists are aware of it, they just don't talk about it. And, and it's also Haldane, Haldane's Dilemma, if you ever heard of that. He was a famous uh, evolutionist in the 1950s. Evolutionist Dr. Dan Breyer of Molecular Biology argued that if most of the human genome is functional, here's an evolutionist admitting to the same problem I just told you about. Each human female needed to, uh, needed to make 10 to the 35th children to prevent human genomic degeneration. He therefore concluded that the human genome must be about 90% junk. <laughs> and so, and this is before we know, now know that the human genome is probably is almost zero junk. We know that now. So I wonder if he would change his opinion. I doubt it. Because it's never been about the science, it's always been about religion, the world view. It's a humanistic religion. So there is, we are finding, you know, we are making headway. I'm finding that more and more evolutionists, they're, they're using different tactics. They're more talking about, you know, the age of the earth and things like that, because the arguments against evolution have become, they're so powerful, and it's, it's embarrassing. I, to try and be an evolutionist and try to, to defend your position is becoming so untenable. And so now there's this scientific dissent from Darwinism. These are secular scientists that have uh, um, started this. We are skeptical of the claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian, Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Okay, so I mentioned Paul Dane. He's the same guy who came up with that same problem with the number of breeding, uh, how many offspring you have to have. He predicted in 1949 that evolution could never produce various mechanisms such as the wheel and magnet, which would be useless but fairly perfect. And yet we have, look at this example of nature. It's so cool, this grasshopper, and these are actual gears under the microscope. Functioning mechanical gears seen in nature for the first time. The draft, has anyone seen this before? It's uh, interesting that so the giraffe has a heart that weighs over 24 pounds and pumps 16 gallons a minute. It has backflow, one-way backflow for ventral valves in the neck to regulate the flow of blood to the head. And it had blood, there's blood vessels in the giraffe's head that are very elastic, and then it has blood vessels near the feet that are thicker and much less elastic. Why? You know, because, uh, and I'm not um, a mechanical engineer, but if you talk to somebody who knows fluid mechanics, if you try to pump fluid against gravity, there's an exponential rate of pressure that you need. So you've got a giraffe who's got this, you know, this huge heart, and then he lowers his head. And how does evolution explain, you know, what happened? Was that like, the, it seems like we find a lot of dead giraffes in the fossil record. You know, or they didn't quite have those valves evolved in the neck. But instead it has, it has valves in the neck that close when he puts his head down. So now your blood doesn't go gushing into the head. And plus it has blood in the reservoir of the head, so that when he's down getting a drink of water, he doesn't pass out. So he has plenty to keep his head down for a while. And then same thing with the effect of gravity, you need to have very thick and you know, much less elastic blood vessels down here. And that's exactly how it's designed. Charles Darwin said this, to suppose that the eye with all inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances for admitting different amounts of light and information, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd to the highest degree possible. So even just considering the eyeball and the complexity of it. But I, I find this super interesting too. And we uh, call this the trochlea challenge and presented this to several evolutionists, including P.Z. Myers. Look at this thing right here. I don't know if my uh, thing will work. Yeah, uh, so this thing right here. Look at that. I mean, how does that evolve? This yeah. muscle go through here over time in natural selection and random mutation to go through this atmosphere that holds it. It's amazing. And here's the other thing. 
it's the exact on the other side of the head, right? You have to have another one. So everything's so perfectly well designed. How in the world can that evolve? They are without excuse. So the origin of language, Darwin said, language slowly and unconsciously developed by many steps from primitive language uh, consisting of grunts. What a silly point of view. Um, scientists have known for years that uh, you know they, they can't explain where language comes from. They certainly don't find an evolutionary origin. Here's what this evolution has said. People with least complex cultures have sophisticated languages with complex grammar and large vocabularies. They can name and discuss anything that occurs in the sphere occupied by their speaker. The oldest language that can be reasonably be reconstructed is already modern, sophisticated, and complete from an evolutionary point of view. So they can't explain it from evolution. And you know, if you think about how our, our language has evolved, it's, it's really beginning to de-evolve rather than we're adding new words to the language. But good luck trying to read an old King James, an original King James Bible. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen, I haven't seen an original, but I've seen a replica. And man, it's hard to, it's hard to understand what's being uh, said. So this professor he said, many attempts have been made to determine evolutionary origin of language and all have failed. Signal recognition, so this is the product we did for uh, Caterpillar, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't sell it to you guys. I don't know why, but it has, you know, has uh, all these things like, you know, this GPS antenna and, um, you know, cellular antenna connector. All, this guy here connects to the, uh, the JTAG network within the truck. All cars have to do that too. Probably out with the new app, but, you know, Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, so basically, what you have is what's called a mutex. You have to control which signal is going out. And there's a point behind all this, so trust me. Um, so in software, we call we have a thing where you have to have, you have access so that whenever you act, whenever you have three different things that need access to shared object, you have to control the mechanism so that they don't both hit it at the same time. If they did, you could clobber data. So mutex is a very important software. Well, it's super interesting that we see the same thing in design in the fertilization process. This is a sea urchin. Um, and this the, the mechanism it uses to, uh, to shut things down when the sperm hits, you know, it hits the egg and actually fertilizes the egg. Because if you get two sperm doing it at the same time, it's called polyspermy, and that's really, really, really bad. So here's what they discovered, and it's a mechanism to prevent this really bad thing called polyspermy. There's a, initially, there's a fast block. So as soon as the egg gets fertilized, there's this resting potential across the egg changes from about minus 70 to 10 mill, uh, millivolts within one to three seconds after fertilization. And then there's a slow block process that's more mechanical, and these, these granulars release their contents into the space between the egg cell membrane and its outer coating, creating a hard envelope that sperm can't get through. This lasts about a minute. So it's an incredible process. And, and Dennis Hoffs is the one who brought this up to me. I don't know who, if anyone remembers Dennis. He actually started Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship many, many, many years ago. Uh, he he uh, lives in Texas now. Uh, great guy. Uh, Okay, so then have any, has anyone heard of the zinc spark? So this is more recent in the news now. This is a human fertilization, which is super cool. And it was interesting that at first they did, they, you know, there was no papers on this being a mechanism to prevent polyspermy. And then uh, when it first came out, and then recently they have admitted they found evidence that it helps prevent polyspermy. So on cue, at the time of fertilization, we see the egg release thousands of packages, each dumping a million zinc atoms, and then it's quiet. So all these little, when the egg gets fertilized, all these little packets here release a million zinc atoms. So there's a total of over a billion release at the same time. And so th then there's another burst of zinc release. Each egg has four or five of these periodic sparks. It's beautiful to see, orchestrate, orchestrated much like a symphony. So think of the information and design to do this. So, and then as I mentioned, we now know um, that it's, uh, it's, this mechanism helps prevent polyspermy. So it's similar to what we do in software with the mutex. So watch this, uh, here's an example. This is a the zinc uh, spark in mice. So these are eggs that are getting full, uh, fertilized real time. And you'll see a spark as an egg gets fertilized. So I'll go ahead and start it.
pretty amazing. And then this, here's the uh, human egg getting fertilized at the moment of fertilization, right there. It's called the zinc spark. Pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to close with this, and it's uh, um, it's my uh, one of my favorite examples of uh, the design of nature. Um, it's such a cool presentation. It lasts about two minutes, and it's uh, how these animals could use camouflage. It's so cool. So we're going to start this. Sounds like we're somehow got switched over. they use to avoid being eaten. To use this feature, please make sure your app is running and can access the internet. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And a lot of what goes on inside, there's a fish with glowing eyes, pulsating eyes. Some, some of the colors are designed to hypnotize. These lovely patterns. And then this last one, one of my favorites, this pinwheel design. Just absolutely amazing, every single dive. That's the unknown world. And today, we've only explored about 3%, 3% of what's out in the ocean. Already we found the world's highest mountains, world's deepest valleys, underwater lakes, underwater waterfalls. A lot of that we shared with you from the stage. And in a place where we thought no life at all, we find more life, we think, in diversity and density than the tropical rainforest, which tells us that we don't know much about this planet at all. There's still 97%, and either that 97% is empty or just full of surprises. But I want to jump up to shallow water now and look at some creatures that are positively amazing. The cephalopods, headfoots. As a kid, I knew Miss Calamari most of them, but this is an octopus. This is the work of Dr. Roger Hamlin at the Marine Biological Lab. And just fascinating how, how cephalopods can, with their eyes, incredible eyes, sense their surrounding, look at light, look at patterns. Here's an octopus moving across the reef, finds a spot to settle down, curls up, and then disappears into the background. Tough thing to do. In the next bit, we're going to see a couple of squid. These are squid. Now, males, when they fight, if they're really aggressive, they turn white. And these two males are fighting. They do it by bouncing their butts together, which is an interesting concept. Now, here's a male on the left and a female on the right. And now, the male has managed to split his color, coloration so the female only always sees the kinder, gentler squid in him. And the males are now... <laughs> we're going to see it again. Let's take a look at it again. Watch the coloration. White on the right. Brown on the left, he takes a step back, so he's keeping off the other males by splitting his body and he comes up on the other side, bingo. Now, I'm told that's not just a squid phenomenon with males, but I don't know that's it. Cuttlefish, I love cuttlefish. This is a giant Australian cuttlefish, and there he is, his droopy little eyes up here. But they can do pretty amazing things too. Here we're going to see one backing into uh, crevice and, and watch, his, watch his tentacles. He just pulls them in, makes them look just like algae. Disappears right into the background. Positively amazing. Here's two males fighting. Once again, they're, they're smart enough, these cephalopods, they know not to hurt each other, but look at the patterns that they can do with their skin. Okay? Just an amazing thing. Here's an octopus. Sometimes they don't want to be seen when they move because predators can see them. And here, this, this guy actually can make himself look like a rock. And looking at this environment, can actually slide across the bottom using the waves and the shadows so he can't be seen. This blends right into the, this motion blends right into the background. The moving rock trick. So we're learning lots new from the shallow water, still exploring that deep, learning lots from the shallow water. That's a good reason why. I mean, the shallow water is full of predators. Here's a barracuda. And if you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to really understand how to use your surroundings to hide. In the next scene, you're going to see a nice coral bottom. And you see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change <coughs> color and texture. There's some algae in the foreground. And an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 
Now, Rogers spooked him so that he took off, a cloud of ink lands, and when he lands, the octopus says, what I've been seeing, best thing to do is get as big as I can get. That big brown makes his eye spot very big. So he's bluffing. Let's do it backwards. I thought he was joking when he first showed it. So I thought it was all graphics. So here, here it is in reverse. Watch the skin color. Watch the skin texture. Just an amazing animal. Can change color and texture to match the surroundings. Watch them blend right into this algae. One, two, three. <laughs> now he's gone and so am I. Thank you very much. Okay, so Romans 1, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even, even his eternal power of Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So, you know, God's evidence for creation is the creation itself. Things that are made. So, if you look at faith from West, Webster's Dictionary, it's the belief and trust in, and loyalty to God, okay? Belief in the traditional doctrines of religion. Firm belief in something for which there is no proof. So that's how the world likes to ridicule Christians. Is faith is uh, something which there is no proof. But we know that, that the Bible defines faith differently. It's the hope of the, uh, substance of things hoped for, okay? And the evidence of things not seen. So our faith is based on, it's an intelligent faith based on uh, overwhelming evidence. We weren't expected to just have no faith. And if you think of the example of John the Baptist, he, uh, here it says, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you to come to us or do we look for another? This is after all the experiences that John the Baptist already had with Christ. And he was in prison at this time. And so, you know, who can imagine what it's like to be in prison? And he went through a, you know, it seems to me, and I know people can view this differently, but uh, it seems part of this is just a brief, a little bit of doubt, just a little bit about Christ. And what did Christ say? Did he say, ye of little faith? No. He said, Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor of the gospel preach to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So it's interesting, too, if you ever watch a video about the book of John, it's, it's super cool. It, 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 uh, it, the manuscript for the movie is the book of John. I mean, they do very, very little uh, um, text outside of the book of John. And if you watch it, like, as a movie, it's interesting how much time Jesus is like, man, I'm doing all these miracles, and you still don't believe. He's doing these incredible things, showing incredible evidence that he is who he claims to be. So that's it. Um, any questions on any of the stuff I've over today? Yeah. Can you make a little more of a comment? I saw the word vestigial used for the, you know, the whole telomere or whatever. But, yeah. And I'm just kind of going, you think maybe they learned because there were all those vestigial organs and then there was junk DNA and everything's all proven wrong and, and, and it's like, they just so want there to be some leftover useless yeah. junk yeah. That, yeah. that they can't put it away. It's, it's like, and it's, and it's they, just, just for the sake of, you know, not looking stupid, you might think you'd not want to say things like that. Yeah, and it's, and it's harmful science, too, because who had their tonsils removed? You know, before they discovered that, you know, you shouldn't have them removed unless there's a really compelling reason. And there's still a reason to remove them, but it's not like it was. They remove them for any old, you know, and it turns out they were good at fighting, you know, colds yeah. and stuff. Do you get more colds in them? That's not the So, I was lucky. I just missed that when they just started figuring out, well, we shouldn't be taking out tonsils. I think my little brother had his taken out. So I was fortunate. I missed that bad science by about two years. So The only good part of it was the ice cream. Yeah, that's true. I heard that there's lots of that. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, in terms of the you know, uh, evolutionary things, the junk really is all of the written materials, the books and everything that explain how things evolved, that now that's the junk. <laughs> True, that's a good point. <laughs> I like that. Yep. If 
Okay, well, thank you, Fred. Let's thank Fred for coming to us.